Ted Kotcheff, do you go to the movies much these days? Of course, I'm a, I'm a member of the Academy, and um, Academy screens all possible co uh, contenders for the for the Oscar. So I, I see I go to I go to the nights at films. I see about two or three films, four or three or four films even a week. So what do you think of what's out there? What's your general impression of filmmaking in the 21st century? Oh, I, you know, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, Jim, that over the past three or four years, I've been, the films have been, I, I've had to struggle sometimes to find two films to nominate for the Oscar, let alone five. But this year, the films are fabulous. I mean, I've seen about ten fabulous films. I gotta know which which one. It, and it's a great Australian film um, called Hacksaw Ridge. Mel Gibson. Huh? The Mel Gibson film. Mel Gibson, yeah. Oh, and Mel Gibson. He, the, the direction is absolutely brilliant, Jim. I mean, I, I, I'm hoping that I can meet him. So uh, every, every, I'm, I'm recommending the film to everybody, but in Australia, everybody should see this film because it's just amazing. <laughs> Do you see any of the popcorn movies, Ted? Do you see any of the superhero franchise films? Like what? Well, I don't know. Do you go see your... Your, your Thors, your Captain Americas, your Iron Mans. Do you guys see any of the franchise films that are out there? I, 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 I don't like those kind of films. Okay. Uh, um, I mean, uh, I know that they, they say here, if the, they say here in Hollywood that if the picture doesn't have man in the title, it can't get financed. So <laughs> you, I, and, and man, Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, Batman meets Superman. I mean, it's, no, I don't, I don't. <laughs> No, no, I, but there's so many good films that this year. They're amazing. It's yeah. absolutely amazing. You're gonna. I saw another one. Was loving um, a film about about uh, interracial marriage in Virginia because 20 years ago it was totally illegal for a black white man to marry a black woman, and and it's just a terrific film. It says uh, Hacksaw Ridge, as I told you, by by uh, Mel Gibson is mm. a great film. Uh, well, there's so many films. I, I don't I don't want to list them all. But now, this, this year is going to be it's going to be a tough for me to nominate five films. I mean, because I've seen ten films so far that I think they're worthy of being nominated. So, Ted, okay. you've been making film and TV for around sixty years. Do you know it all? <laughs> you never know it all, my dear friend. <laughs> no, the, the, um, the I, I'd like to I'd like to think it that. Uh, I know, I know, I know now finally how to make, how to, how to realize my films. Do you know, I always say the, the best word for what I do, the English word directing is no, is no good. A director sounds like a guy who works at a bank or a corporation. The French word realisateur, a realizer, is the great word for what I do. I have a vision in my head and I realize it and turn it into a reality. And I think that's 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 what I try to. I hope that as I more and more that I do that, but but every every film is special. It's different. You can't you can't make I, generalities. That that, that that But but of course there are some pra practical ones, but not not but not ideological and creative and aesthetic ones. Mm. Each one is special. Now I understand that one of your great mentors as a young filmmaker. In Canada was Sidney Newman. Sidney Newman. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, what were one of what would be one of the filmmaking principles that he's passed on to you that you found so valuable that you would pass on to a young filmmaker? Well, I tell you, I tell you, the, the person who had the most influence on me, uh, Sidney did. Sidney gave me my first opportunity. That's yeah. what, and that's what. And he was amazing, uh, but, but but he was a documentary filmmaker. So he the things he taught me were that had to do with documentary filmmakers I, and how the the when I when I was writing the scripts for the documentaries, I would have the and he'd read it and say, Ted, you're you're ha the pictures are saying this. You're having you're saying the same thing in the in the words as it's on the screen. You have, you can have, you have two up you have two chances here. The pictures are saying one thing, and the words are saying something else. So, and of course that applies to films as well, of course, but, 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 but it certainly applies to documentaries. He said you have two, two, two ways of communicating. But the man who really had the biggest effect on me, Jim, was the great 
French film maker, Italian filmmaker, rather, uh, Michelangelo Antonioni. It is a long story, but it's worth it's worth it. The the um, what happened was he, he Michelangelo Antonioni came to London and made a film called Blow Up um, about a f- photographer who happens accidentally to photograph what he thinks a murder. Anyway, it's a it's an amazing film, and everybody knew about it because he <laughs> Antonioni shot the scene in a park, the crucial scene where the murder takes place in a park. And he didn't like the color of the leaves. And he had the art department repaint all the leaves in the park. <laughs> I love it. At <laughs> any rate, um, the producer was a Bulgarian like myself in London. And uh, after the picture was over, I get a phone call from him. And he says to me, uh, are you looking at me or not? And he says to me, Ted, um, listen, we feel the picture is too long. And we want to make we want to cuts. And Tony Oni loved your film, Life at the Top, with Lawrence Harvey and Gene Simmons. And uh, he says, and he likes your youth. So he said, um, would you would you like? Because we don't know neither Carlo Ponti nor myself nor Michelangelo. We don't you don't know what to cut. And we got we feel the picture's about 20 minutes too long. I said, Pierre, don't give me that prudisorial crap. You're going behind Michelangelo and Tony's back. And I'm not going to participate in this. This is ravishing, you know, <laughs> of this great artist. He said, Ted, you're so cynical. He said, how can I convince you to do this? I said, very simple, get Michelangelo and Tony to phone me. Bye. And uh, half hour later, ding, 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 Michelangelo and Tony on the line. And uh, I was knocked out. And he said, I want someone like you, Ted, because you're young, you're so talented. I loved your film. But you're also you've got no cliches in it. I don't want some old fucking fart who's uh, <laughs> whose head is full of old cliches. You're fresh. You got a whole fresh approach. That's what I want. So I, I did it, and, and he used most of my cuts. And then to, to cut to make the story short, he asked me to dinner, and in Ro- in Rome, and I had to go to Rome on other occasions. So we had dinner together. So when I asked him, what? Why do you have us on this film? Blow up, you have eight writer credits. How can there be eight writer credits? And he says, you see, Ted, unlike you Hollywood directors, we consider we consider dialogue to be sound effects. And a, pic, a film is a pictorial creation. It is not dialogue. Dialogue is for the theater. A film is pictures. I said, yes. He said, he said, um, he said, look, in the scene, there's a scene there where the husband, the wife, slams the, the door in the, in the husband's face. Well, you have to hear a slam. That's like, but that's not what, this, what the scene is about. This barrier has been created between the two. Will it be removed or not? I said, well, I don't get it. But, uh, but, 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 but what, why are you getting any writers? He said, well, we have one writer. He and I, we write the film as if it is a silent film. Strictly pictures. I said, you mean like a treatment? No, 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 not a treatment. As if it's if it was a silent film era, we could make the, we could make a film. It's a hundred page silent film. And then he goes away. And then I say we, then I speak to the producer. I say, who should we get to, to write the scenes between the husband and the wife? Get Jim Shembre. He's great. He's great. So we get Jim Shembre comes in and he writes the scenes all the dialogue between the husband and the wife, and then and they say, there's an action sequence. What do we get? They say, get Ted Koch. Ted Koch would be great. He writes the dialogue for the action sequence. Just, and that's how we get to be eight writers, you see, because the, the dialogue is not important, but it has to be there. And they're obviously moving their mouth. They have to say something. But the thing is, you communicate the essence of the picture, of the film, with pictures. And it had a tremendous, i got to tell you, Jim, it had an enormous effect on me. It was, I was a young director. I was 29. Mm. I'd only done two films. And I said, I understand. What were the two films that you had done? What? At the time, I went to England because I went, made my, all my early films were British films. Jim, right. I had, there was no film industry in Canada whatsoever at the time. So I, you either had to go to Hollywood or you mm. had to go, or go to London. And I chose to go to London because I wanted to work in the theater as well. And, um, and I 
I did two films. I did I did a, a kind of a social comedy with with James Mason and John Mills called Tiara Tahiti. It was kind of a social comedy, and then I did this. I told you, Life at the Top. Right. With Lawrence Harvey and Gene Simmons. Okay, so you got that piece of advice. You got that lesson from Antonioni before you made Wake in Fright. Of course. So Wake in Fright, it seems to be a perfect example and illustration of that philosophy at work. That's right. Because it's such a powerful visual film. It was just a night. I wasn't telling you that story, Jim, idly. I wanted to tell you because I thought you're exactly right. Mm. It had a big effect on Wake and Fright. And how does Wake and Fright stand in your filmography artistically, Ted? Artistically, I, I, I think it, it's one of the two greatest films, uh, two, great, two, two, two of the best films that I've made. Um, that one, and I mean, Wake and Fright and uh, The Apprentice with Goody Kravitz. In as much as I think, uh, whatever I set out to do, that's how I measure my success with the, my attitude to the film. Did I realize what I had in my head? In those two films, I realized as close to 100% as one can get in both of them, what I set out to do. And um, so, uh, and, there, and you know, the, both those films have been recognized as for their artistry and have, have been declared can classics. Can you describe the feel of the film and what accounts for its enduring power? Because it is the most unsettling, haunting film I think that's ever been shot in this country, still. Well, that's very nice for you to say so. I mean, um, both, both those two films, the characters are people who do not know themselves. And in the case of Wake and Fright, he thinks he's better than everybody else, but he rapidly discovers that we, all of us are in the same existential boat and there's, and that he's no different from anybody else. No better, not better than anybody else, no different than anybody else. So I think part of that, that that's the theme. But I think that, um, let's say something about the, uh, about the film. Um, it was a, One of the things that made them, for me, made the film, something which I did in that film, which uh, I'd never done before, uh, maybe under the, under the influence of Antonioni, um, I said, um, I caught the production designer and the costume designer in the room, and I said, boys, I want the audience to feel the heat and the dust and the flies. I want them to feel it. Not just, see, I just see, but it had the, an impact on itself. I don't want any cool colors in my film. I don't want to ever see a blue or a green. I only want red, yellow, orange, hurt sienna, brown, all the colors of heat. That's what I want now. So they said, okay. So if you look at this film, there's, the, there's, there's no cool colors. It's all hot colors. Then, then um, when I was out there, uh, the, um, I, I, despite the fact that I wore a hat that had corks on threads that swung in front of my eyes like that to keep the flies out of my eyes, didn't protect, they didn't, uh, didn't uh, stop them from entering my mouth. And whenever, whenever I was saying action, a fly would go into my mouth. <laughs> now, I used to eat about 12 to 14 flies every day. It's not, it's not a bad dish. It's not a gourmet dish, but it's, it's, it's not one that I would recommend to you. But... So I said, I want, I got the University of Sydney to provide me with hundreds of flies that were sterilized. And before every take and inside, I would release 15 or 20 flies into the set. Now, there's a thing that the French call, the French philosopher Leibniz, I think, called petite apperception. I mean, small apperceptions. Like, I'm looking at you. But I see Star Wars, and I see the, the new T-shirt, and behind you I see the wood. And, and, uh, and it has, and it's unusual, the wooden wall behind you is unusual. Um, uh, and so that's what Petite Perception is. I'm looking at your face, and you're the thing, and yet there's other things are hitting my eye too. 
and it has an effect on it, but but it's unconscious. So I'm releasing the flies, and I yes, I did the same thing. I had barrels of Fuller's earth that was that was dyed the same color as the the dirt, the sand out in the, the dirt out in the outback, and I had a fly fly that one of those fly things, and I put the, I, I would put I would put this Fuller's earth and the cortex. I would spray spray it all over everything, and it would be all this dust would be hanging in the air. So I felt the. Um, a combination of, I think, this attention to details, the detail, had a, I think, a tremendous powerful influence on people. You know, you really felt like you, you really felt you were there. You felt the heat, the sweat, the dust, and the flies, and everything else. But well, what is it about this? One reason, but, I mean, but the theme, the theme of it, is a man who doesn't know himself, and he who discovers himself, and. Um, I think that's one man's descent into hell. I think that that's a, something that it's, I guess it's, it comes from me, Jim. I don't know myself. I don't know what makes me do the things that I do. Even to this time, I'm 85 and I still don't know. I do things. I say, well, Ted, why did you do that? Oh, I think about this. And I think that this is a, a situ- an existential situation that many human, many, many human men and women find themselves in. And I think that this, that's why that, that subject, that, that character, is so inter- that's so hypnotically interesting. Now, Ted, um, we're familiar with the uh, remarkable story about how close the film came to being lost, how yes. close the film came to oblivion. On top of that, you later realised that Bruce Beresford, Peter Weir, Fred Shepsey, and no doubt other directors were heavily influenced by this movie. The film came out in 1971, which I refer to as the pre-Renaissance era in Australian film, when the only films getting made were independent films, where people put every cent they had into making films because there was no real industry here. You must have had a a realisation at some point that was new to you about the long-term influence that film can have not just on filmmakers, but, Ted, on an entire culture. We owe, in some part, the Australian film renaissance on the influence of that movie. Well, it's, it's lovely. Thank you for saying that. I mean, that was, I mean, I, I befriended Fred Skepsey. I knew Bruce Beresford. And, and uh, do you know who... Do you know who's, I, they came to a young man came to me, and said, "Could I watch you work, Mr. Kachev? I'm, I'm a would-be director." And I said, "Sure, I always do that." I, I said, "Because I, I think you want to. If you want to be a filmmaker, you you've got to learn the, de- the work, going to film school. Yes, you learn a lot about cameras and things, but the, the, the actual." filmmaking and the process of working with the camera working with the actors and everything else that goes wrong and right and um that that you you can't learn you you can till you learn till you see it and so i said to this young man yes you can watch me direct and he stayed for a couple of weeks and uh, i liked him a lot I mean, we, 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 we hired i was too busy working and we only kind of chatted informally um and then and then Fred Skepsi said to me, Ted, you know that young director that you allowed to sit in while you were shooting? I said, yeah, who is that? He said, Peter Weir. <laughs> <laughs> this was years afterwards. Because yeah. I befriended Fred Skepsi. And it was Fred Skepsi who said to me, Ted, you don't realize what you did with that film. Mm. I said, what did I do? He said, up to then, we thought only good films could be made in London or in Hollywood, but can't make good films in, in Australia, but, but then we saw your film and said, oh, oh my God, you can make great films in Australia. All of us saw that. Bruce Beresford and Fred Skip, we all said the same thing. And that's, that's what you did for us. But he was the one that, uh, that said the same thing which you just said about you know, the renaissance of, of uh, Australian films. Um, I don't know how often this point has come up, but we have very bad memories in Australia. And um, it's too easy to forget the importance of certain films. There appears to be a revival of interest. 
But so I'm very pleased to make that point to you. But before then, you must not have realized the influence that film can have. And did it change anything in your mindset about the power of cinema? Did it make you realize that cinema had a power that you didn't fully know about beforehand? Yes, uh, yeah, you're, well, you put your fingers right on something which no one has ever seen before, but I, something that I felt deeply that that was a turning that film was a turning point for me too, um, and uh, the the power of it, and um, and the way it, it could have, it affect people's minds um, and a whole culture. Um, I could, I couldn't believe it, but I but I certainly understood its power, mm. and uh, it was an object lesson to me. You know, I, that film. It was it was the first my first great film. I'm great, I say great in my own estimation. My my first great film, <laughs> and and uh, and and uh, that was that's that was when when uh, uh, I really felt when the film disappeared. And uh, get lost, and and uh, and uh, and nobody could find it. And one of the man, one of the producers, the NLT, I forgot which one, at NLT Productions in Sydney, said that they couldn't. He said, he said, where's the film? Because a lot of critics said, what, what happened to uh, Wake and Fright? And he said nobody could find a, co a, a copy of it, and B they didn't know where the negative was. And it, well, you know the whole story, so I won't go through the whole thing. But, but, but the, the producer, the producer, the NLT said, "This is a national disaster." <laughs> rather, rather hyperbolically, so I called it, described it as a national disaster. Well, that is uh, so, remarkable. How? Uh, and then, sorry, go on. And then, and then, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. and then, Anthony Buckley, the editor, the great editor of the film. I mean, this guy is this guy is a master. Anthony Buckley, I love him. I hope I see him when I come to Australia. He, he, he always thought the film was a masterpiece, an Australian masterpiece, and he made it, and he made it one a decision that he was going to find this, find this negative wherever it was. And at his own time, and with his own money, nobody paid him. He went all over the place. He, first, he went to London because the film was processed in London, Pinewood. They, they said, Nah, 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 we. We, we, we sent the film back to some company. Well, what company in America? I don't know. It was some company. I don't know. And what had happened, and then he went to Dublin because he heard there was a copy in, uh, of the film in Dublin, but it was true, proved to be not true. He went to New York, couldn't find it, and, um, and then he discovered that the, the, the original company had gone bankrupt and the film had gone to, 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 kept to creditors. Uh, what creditors? So, so the, and nobody knew what creditors had the film and finally but through perseverance and he, he spent 14 years of his life trying to find that negative and finally don't ask me how I'm, I gotta find out how he, he he discovered the negative in a warehouse in Pittsburgh of all places there were two huge boxes full of Interpositive, internegative, soundtracks, music tracks, everything was there. And on each of the two boxes in big red letters, it said, For Destruction. For Destruction. My dear boy, my dear Jim, had he arrived, had Buckley arrived, one week later, the film would have been incinerated and gone forever. It's a remarkably uh, telling anecdote about the difference between then and now about attitudes to film preservation. Well, you know, the, well, the thing about films is if, if, not, if they don't make a lot of money, which you didn't the first time around, if it's a useless object, a useless, worthless object, and who, who wants to pay money keeping paying, paying storage charges? So burn it. Next, <laughs> make room for the next film. And then, of course, I had this wonderful guy whose name slips my mind. It worked... It worked uh, at the uh, in, in Sydney, at, um, uh, and he spent he spent uh, about six months of his life going over going through the film because the film hadn't been looked after for twelve years, so it was torn, 
ripped, faded, you know, and he restored it, restored it. Worked on his own, again, on his own time. I find the name of this guy because I love him. I shall do. And he, and he, he restored the film, frame, frame by frame, yeah. digitally. My, I like you to know, talk. That's what really made, you know what, what warmed my heart, that the people felt so strongly about the film, that they dedicated 14 years of his life and this, the, uh, this, this uh, the guy who, who worked for me in, in the uh, restoring it, because they did it all out of love, mm. and that's what, that's what really moves moves me. Ted, can we yeah, can we just touch on some of your other films? Um, yeah, sure. Because your, your filmography is uh, pretty formidable, and uh, you know we, we do have to mention them. But just quickly, you did work on uh, Law and Order for a while. Didn't you? What was yeah. it like going back to TV? Well, I, what happened was about, about a few years ago, um, Dick Wolf liked all my films and he phoned me up and said, listen, I got an idea for a series, which I think is just, that this, that's it. And uh, he told me what it was. And I said, well, geez, that, that interests me because it, it, I didn't want to make a, when, when somebody said about it, that, um, another police series, I said, oh, you know, that's, I don't want to do something else that everybody's done before. But then when I hear about the, the area that the police are working in, it's an area that's television never gone into this area, you know, uh, of sexual uh, uh, sexual matters and uh, rapes and child molestation. And open up. No one had ever brought it out into the opening what was going on. And so it, it appeals to me. And um, I did, I produced 289 shows and I directed about 25 of them. Mate, uh, Daddy Kravitz, you mentioned before, as being the other film that you hold yes. with the highest esteem. That is, again, a film that stands up today. Um, that character is quite a, a character to follow. He ends up being consumed with the importance of money and of material status. Um, quite a cynical film, and again, a film that still has a lot of power, a lot of comic power as well, because... You directed it with a um, a lightness of touch. What are your reflections on Daddy Kravitz? Well, of course, you know that film was very important to me because my best friend wrote the novel. In fact, we shared a flat in London together when he was writing that novel. And when the, and when, the, when he wrote the last page, he said, "Ted, I'd like you to read this novel which I've written." And I sat down. And I read it in one sitting. I read just read it right through, and I uh, and I finished. And I said, "Mordecai, Mordecai Rushmore was." The author. I said, Mordecai, not only is this one the, the greatest novel ever written in Canada, but one day I'm going to go back to Canada and make a film out of it. And we all sort of laughed at, laughed at the absurdity of such a thing. There being no film industry whatsoever. But anyway, I I love I love that character, and Richard Dreyfuss played it brilliantly mm. because he um, Richard was great because he does horrible things. He betrays his girlfriend. He betrays his friends. All because he thinks he wants to, the only way he can be somebody is to own this land. That's right. And he'll do anything, and he'll do anything to get the money for the land. So, but but at the same time, he does such despicable things, but you never lost your interest in him or really caring about him. And Richard, Richard was responsible, I think, for a lot of that. You really, you really felt for this guy in the grip of this ridiculous <laughs> idea. <laughs> Now so with was, you know what makes and again you know again the other thing, Jim is I'm trapped like like wake and fright. This is a character who does not know himself. And one of the one of the one of the gangsters says to him, Kravitz, why do you always run around like you got a red hot poker up your ass? And that's and that's what and that's what this film's about. Why does he run around all the time like he got a red hot poker up his ass? <laughs> and I think <laughs> and I think that the, the uh, Again, another man who doesn't know himself and what's driving him. He doesn't have the slightest idea what's motivating him. Now, with First Blood, you um, you did a number of things there. You you tapped into the post-Vietnam vibe of America that was really looking at the post-mortem of Vietnam and on the plight of veterans. You also revived Sylvester Stallone's career, who apparently nobody wanted to cast in the film, because he'd been in a number of failures, uh, except you. You really wanted him for the role. You also, Ted, 
probably unwittingly seeded the notion of the movie franchise in which we live in today because, of course, the film has gone on <laughs> to become well, uh, a fra- yeah, and is being that, remade that, now. You know, the, um, I, I, I always wanted, so it's the first person after I, I, after I wrote the script, I first person I wanted to in the part was Sylvester Stallone. And the people tried to talk me out of it. They said, no, 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 Ted. Because received the Hollywood wisdom was, he only works as Rocky. Those other four film, films he made, Fist, uh, Paradise Alley, uh, Nighthawks, none of, them, none of them worked. Only He only works as Rocky. I said, I don't give a damn. This guy, I know, I, he's, I, he's my first choice, and he's perfect for the part. He's got toughness. But at the same time, there's something very touching about him. And... and and uh, I said, uh, and, and, and I, I just love that, the, the, those opposite qualities within the character. And I, I want him. And, uh, and, and I got him, and he gave a great performance. And also, he, he helped me. He, he, one thing, when I got him, he said, Ted, I understand you're rewriting the script. I said, yeah. He says, can I participate? I said, well, of course. You're great. I think Rocky's a brilliant spot. And we, we wrote it. We worked on the last draft of that script together. And originally it was meant to be a, a wordless character, but at some point Stallone convinced you that he has to speak at some point. Yes. <laughs> well, that's right. At one point, at one point, he came in. I mean, uh, uh, the came and said, "Ted, how about if 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 um, Rambo never speaks ever?" And I said, "Oh, I love it! I love it!" So of course, as a director, I love extreme ideas like that. Oh, I said, "I love it! We're great!" But well, actually, he never says a word. And but of course. I, then after what we, we tried, we, we worked on the script for two or three days, and finally I said, you know, Sylvester, it looks forced that he never speaks. If I wish you, it, it doesn't come naturally. He said, yeah, you're right, Ted, you're right, Ted. I says, but it had a very healthy effect on the on the script. It made it very laconic. He and also he he hardly says anything. He says a few like like they drew first blood, not me. I mean, so they, they drew first blood. Six words, but somehow they're so strong. They drew first blood. I mean, you know what I'm saying? So it had, it had the power of the economy of language, which you gave each word when it came out. Now, Ted, Ted please, p- please excuse the vulgarity of this next question, but I've got to ask it. Um, there, there was then a Rambo franchise, and Rambo is now in the process of being rebooted as a franchise. Um, Awake and Fright is also being adapted into a TV series or a TV miniseries. Do you get a piece of any of this? Are you no. looking forward to a new batch of royalty checks in the mail? No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't get any. I don't think I get anything. That's not fair. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I certainly don't. Uh, not, uh, Rambo had... I, I, they wanted me to direct the sequels, but I didn't want to direct the sequels. Right. Uh, of Rambo. I, I don't like doing sequels to my films in any case. And and then in the case of Rambo, my film it was against violence. He, he hates violence. Um, he, he, he saw too much killing in Vietnam. Um, and so and then the episode two, they turned him into a killing machine. He killed about 75 people. So I said, no, 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 this is not the character. And I said, no, no, I don't want to do it. Anyway, I, as I said, I, th- I never did the sequel to... Uh, Weekend at Bernie's, they wanted me to, I said, no, no, this, this is, I, as I said, I only, I inhabit this, the world of a film for a year, and then once, once I've done it, I don't want to go back and then re- rethink it and do another film about the same, of the same character, it doesn't appeal to me. I've got to be honest with you, I, I enjoyed Weekend at Bernie's very much, but I always considered the sequel of that movie one of the most brilliantly improbable sequels of a film ever made. <laughs> I just thought I'd, I'd tell you that. Um, I, I often use it as a great punchline, um, but I do believe that. But with Weekend at Bernie's, you say that you've never made a film that you didn't love. What was it? Because the film appears as a bit of a um, an anomaly in your filmography, but according to you, no, you love that movie. What was it about the film that you loved? Oh, that, well, it's very funny. Um, what happened there was um, that uh, my friend Robert Caymans and I, uh, Bob, uh, we had worked together before, and um, one day he came to me and he said, Ted, 
I really would like to work with you on something. I said, what's that? He said, I got this idea in my head that's driving me crazy. I said, well, what is it, Bobby? He said, I keep seeing these two guys dragging a dead body around, pretending it's alive. I said, oh, that sounds interesting. Well, how, how did they get there? He says, I don't know. And I said, well, what happens afterwards? He says, I don't know. That's why I would like to work with you and work it all out. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did work. <laughs> but, I, but I thought it was a wonderfully... Uh, I found a very provocative idea. Oh, well, I, I, it, it, allowed, it allowed for a lot of social criticism. People, nobody gives a damn when, when they're trying to get something out of you. They don't care whether you're alive or dead. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> and it appealed to me. I mean, I always like, for example, the business that I had with a girl. He's sitting on the sofa dead, and the girl comes up to find him, and she says, um, Bernie, I'm going to take some if you don't mind. She puts her hand, she's locked back of him, she puts her hand in his inside pocket and pulls out a bag of cocaine. Thanks, Bernie. And she goes <laughs> it. So that was like, epitom epitomized the whole attitude. You know, they don't care whether you're alive or dead. Look, if you're, as long as they can get what they want out of you. In a bizarre way, it actually fits into the existential theme of Daddy Kravitz and Wake and Fright, doesn't it? <laughs> 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 Mate, j j just two more films I need to ask you about. A film that's very, very hard to find um, and I think there's actually an extraordinary movie, Split Image, about cults. I like that. I like the theme of that film. It was a time when, when America had become really coarse and mercantile, and all about and very materialistic, and not a not a trace of anything spiritual. And I think that's why the young people were attracted to these cults. And I think it was a very interesting world that was created by as a result of that at the time. Mm. Why all these? Because people are saying, why are all these kids going in these cults? I said, because they're trying to find something, some meaning for life. They want to find something spiritual, some spiritual message. That's why. I it's said, that's why. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do in my film. It certainly did reflect the cultural malaise of America in the 1970s. Yeah. And whenever we discuss um, 1970s American cinema, which was such an important decade, that film always comes up as being a reflection of what was missing in the lives of a lot of people that drove them to cults, That's and right. then, and That's then, right. to, yeah. yeah. And absolutely. you nailed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's exactly the theme, Jack. And uncommon valor, I think a very underrated film, Ted, about yep. uh, MIAs. Again, strangely, um, often compared or, or referenced to the Rambo films, which also were about MIAs. But there you had a great cast, including Gene Hackman, going back to Vietnam. Can, you ask, can I ask you what made you want to return to the theme of the Vietnam veteran so long after First Blood? Well, they were connected, obviously. And uh, I think that the, the whole, I, I find the whole theme of what happened to the American experience in Vietnam um, that I wanted to deal with. Deal, I had dealt with it once, but now I wanted to deal with it again. And, and uh, Gene Hackman was absolutely brilliant in it and perfect choice for it. But I thought that the, uh, the whole, so going back to that war was a very, it was a very provocative uh, idea. It had great appeal. To pe people loved that film. How did it do commercially? Yeah. It did pretty good. And it, with the note, I mean, the, the Paramount, uh, the head of Paramount apologized to me because they, they, it opened the film with no, no publicity whatsoever they, because I didn't think it was going to be successful. And then it became successful, but had they really poured their, uh, let, their, let their advertising machine go to work on it, it could have been hugely successful. But with no publicity whatsoever, people went and saw that film. Ted, I want to thank you so much um, for the time that you've given me. I really do appreciate it. Again, I'd like to go through every single film that I can. In fact, I'm going to just squeeze, can I just squeeze in one more? North Dallas 40, which I think was the first film to actually acknowledge the very, very uncomfortable oil and water mixture of sport and business. The film that has that great line, when I call it a game, you call it a business. 
When I call it a business, you call it a game. It's a great film about modern sport, made back in 1979. Can you just give me a reflection on North Dallas 40? Well, that's, uh, you nailed it. I mean, that's what really appealed to me about uh, no one had really dealt with this whole area of professional sports and, and, and the conflicts um, that resulted from this multi, about, about it being a sport, a game, and, and a business. And sometimes the two clashed, and sometimes they had a deleterious effect on one another. And so I thought it was, um, and Nick Nolte was absolutely brilliant in it. It's not funny, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to him, I spoke to him yesterday, but we haven't spoken for quite a while. But I think that uh, exactly, you nailed it when you said that, when the guy says, when, when, I, you, 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 when I call it a game, you call it a business. When I call it a business, you call it a game, you know. That, that's, that's the irrevoc- irrevocable kind of opposites that are, ple- that, are, that are present all the time in professional sport. And, um, and you know, the, the NFL didn't want that film to be made because they thought, well, obviously why. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Was, um, it, it's, it's considered, and also uh, Sports Illustrated thought it, thought it was the best film ever made about sport, and, and one of the greatest films ever made about professional games, mm. professional sports. Was that best, s- best film ever made about American football. Mm. Certainly Ron Shelton, I hope, sends you Christmas cards every year in thanks for that movie, because he later really played on that theme a lot, and I always tell people, where do you think he got that idea from? You know, the book was written, um, Jim, by um, a professional player who had, who had been an, um, uh, played for the Dallas Cowboys, and he played at tight end, and uh, so he, he, was, he knew all about this. There was no, no questioning his knowledge of the sports and its authenticity, because that's what, the thing that I pursued in that film was authenticity. No one's going to, and um, he, he and, and the players that I used, like, um, John Matuzak, who was the Raiders, Oakland Raiders, um, he he was like my assistant director. He'd say, he'd tell me what what the, what, what the players were thinking, what they were feeling all the time. He'd say, oh, God, he said, listen, when we go out there, we're, we're terrified because the cameras are going to be on us. We, may, we might, might fuck up. We might make a mistake. So it's like going, it's, open night, it's like an opening night on Broadway every time we go out in the playing field. So I tried. So he gave me all sorts of stuff like this, you know, and it was just wonderful, <laughs> you know. And, and I cast I cast real players for most of the uh, most of the the dialogue, and you know, and certainly all. And I had a great a great guy who staged who staged it for me some of the uh, the, the plays. And so, uh, but so they say my it was my my real my real pursuit was authenticity. Chips Rafferty was one of the greatest Australian actors ever. You were the last director to work with him on film. Can I ask you what he was like on the set of that film, given that it was such a caustic view of Australia? I, I, I love Chips Rafferty. I'll tell you my, my funny story about Chips Rafferty. He, he, uh, he, there was a lot of drinking going on, all the scenes he was in. And of course, my, so I, I said to the part man, give me some non-alcoholic beer. And uh, he said, uh, and I he said, sure, okay. So, because I thought, how the, how the hell are you going to act if you have to drink sometimes um, pints and pints of beer? So I put, they had non-alcoholic beer, and I said, action. And Chips got, took the glass and like, like, <laughs> spit it up. What is this, Ted? I said, it's non-alcoholic beer. Ted, I can't act with non-alcoholic beer. And I said, but, 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 but Chips, be sensible. This one shot, one shot, the first take, you drink two pints, right, one after the other. If I do four or five takes, that means eight or ten pints of just on this one shot alone. You'll be drinking all day. you get drunk. He said, Ted... You look after the directing, and I'll look after the drinking. <laughs> and he drank, he drank real beer. Never once did he show the slightest figment of inebriation. Not once did he stumble on a word 
or anything like that. I, I just, I was absolutely, absolutely, you know, in awe of him. And he was a lovely man, a terrific actor. And uh, you really believed he was always there. You really believed in him, you know. And it was just, it was an extraordinary experience.